All right, so in this video we're going to see how to do the third part of the project, which is the unit 4 component of the project. So as usual, we're going to add on to what we did before. So assuming that you completed parts 1 and 2 of the project, uh, make sure you check your gradebook for feedback or anything you need to fix on the project from unit 2, uh, because we will be using that and relying on those numbers to be correct. And uh, if you do remember, the last thing we did was set up this fourth tab on our spreadsheet where we calculated the sample size, sample mean, and sample standard deviation. And we'll be using those to create some confidence intervals. That was the, the big topic for Unit 4, and so we're going to create some confidence intervals. Okay, so uh, the directions basically just say, you know, grab that fourth sheet from your previous part, and step two says to create three confidence intervals uh, for 90%, 95%, and 95% confidence levels. So I'm going to go ahead and type in these confidence levels and we have those. Okay, I can even center those. Uh, next thing we want to do is from that determine the confidence intervals. Uh, and if you looked at the uh, Excel-based video on calculating confidence intervals, you know that uh, we basically used uh, two different types of intervals, T intervals and Z intervals, and we use the uh, sort of critical values and their distributions to then get a margin of error, and then you can add that to the point estimate, which is the sample mean, to get your intervals. So we need a margin of error, and to get that we need a critical value, um, but really the first decision is to use a T interval Z interval. Uh, most of the time in real problems you're using a T interval because a Z interval requires that you have a population standard deviation or an estimate of one. And so, you know, you very well could be working with some data where you did have the whole population in the past and you had the standard deviation from that, and yet that's a good estimate of your current population standard deviation if you just think the mean has shifted. Um, so there are situations where you'd use a Z interval, and it's also a good approximation. Um, we're going to see how it's actually, with a large sample size like this, the Z interval is really close. Um, but uh, for almost everybody in this class, I believe the T interval is the appropriate choice. So I'll be using the T interval approach here. Okay, so the uh, critical value is basically just like a Z score for this distribution. And we want to use the uh, T inverse function. Right? As always, I'm using the kind of the older one. Um, but you can use the newer ones if you want. And uh, it wants the probability, but it basically wants the probability of the tails. That's like alpha, the, um, the alpha value, which is the, jeez, I can't remember. Oh, we haven't covered alpha yet. Sorry. So uh, we'll see alpha in the next, uh, in the next unit. Sorry. Uh, but for now, it's the area of the tails. So if you think of the confidence interval, right, confidence level is the area between the tails. But what Excel actually wants with these distributions is the area of the tails. So that's the way to think about it for now. All right. um, and so that would be 1 minus the confidence level, right? Okay. Uh, degrees of freedom, that is always your sample size minus 1. Unless you're working with multiple samples, then it's, it's different. And that should give us our critical value. Okay, um, If you compare these to some values for the normal distribution, you'll see they're very similar. Uh, and that is because I have a really large sample size. Um, but some of you may have a smaller sample size. Some I've seen some of the projects and the sample sizes are only 100 or something like that. Um, you're probably going to notice more of a difference there. So um, That's the effect of the sample size on the t-interval, or the t-distribution, I should say. Okay, we've got our critical value. We're now ready to get our margin of error. And you want to think of this as like your z-score, and then we have our standard deviation, but of course we need to adjust for the um, sampling distribution, which means we'll be dividing by the square root of the sample size. So you take the uh, z-score and multiply by the number of standard deviations, or sorry, the, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So there's the standard deviation of the sample. If we divide by the square root of the sample size, the central limit theorem says that's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. 
And remember, the, the critical value is just like a z-score, so that really tells you how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. So size of the standard deviation times number of standard deviations gives you your total margin of error. Uh, but of course, we want these two numbers to be the same when we copy and paste down. So you really do need to use F4 to get those to be absolute cell references, because um, the only thing we want to change is the confidence level as we go down. Okay. So here's our margin of error for each one. And then you're able to go ahead and create your confidence intervals. Um, I'm going to do lower bound here. And uh, upper bound here. Uh, so the lower bound is the sample mean, which we don't want to change, um, minus the margin of error. So these are all a little less than the sample mean. And then the upper bound is the sample mean plus the margin of error. And again, you want that sample mean to stay fixed. All right, so now you have your confidence intervals. Uh, next up on the directions, it says to comment on the effect of the confidence level, which is changing here, increasing as you go down, on the width of the interval, which is the double the margin of error, is the width of the interval. So I want you to write a complete sentence here that comments on that relationship and what you're seeing. It's going to be uh, pretty much the same for everybody, so I can't really show an example of that without just giving it away. Uh, but what I can do for four is give an example. And so it does reference the model, which is earlier on in the unit. Um, we're doing confidence interval for a mean. And so there's a model here, and it basically says to write a sentence along the lines of, we are 95% confident. Uh, that the mean, and then you got to say what mean you're actually doing. So this goes back to what is your data set actually measuring, right? I mean, at this point, we might just kind of be lost in these numbers, but um, you've been following along with these videos. My data represents uh, blood pressure, specifically the systolic blood pressure of these people in the study. So we're looking for the mean systolic blood pressure. I mean, and you could go into more detail that it's the mean systolic blood pressure for uh, adults in the U.S. or something like that. Um, but I'm just going to stop there. Uh, and you, it should be between two numbers. Uh, again, we're looking at just the 95%, so you want to use these numbers. And of course, can round them um, to whatever is appropriate. So if I just round to the nearest whole number, you know, it, it doesn't really fare. You, you want to go through a couple decimal places here. So I'm going to do uh, 5... 87 to 119.501. And then you definitely want to add in your units. So for me, the units are millimeters of mercury. So notice that we specify the confidence level, which is going to be 95% for everyone in this activity, uh, but depending on which one you're singling out and interpreting. And then you always say your, you know, what the parameter is. Is it the mean or is it the popular proportion? And then you say specifically what you're talking about. Here it's blood pressure. Then you give the two numbers, and then you give the units. And that's a really good uh, model that should always interpret a confidence interval correctly. All right, so I've got my interpretation there. Uh, going back to the directions, we are on step five. What does it mean to be 95% confident? This is, again, one where it's not really specific to your problem. It's, it's, it's generalized. So everybody should have kind of the same answer, uh, and it should be a complete sentence or two. Uh, but let me give you a hint. I guess it says here, um, use the definition of confidence level. So remember, 95%, that's a confidence level. And if you go up here to confidence level, uh, there's the definition. And so it should actually tell you from that um, what kind of sentence you would write. So just make that definition specific to 95% um, confidence level.
Okay, uh, that brings us to six, uh, where we are taking someone's claim. Uh, someone claims that the population mean is some number outside the 95% confidence interval. So we get our 95% confidence intervals right here. And you don't want to pick something really far out there, right? I mean, you don't want to say something like 100 or something. That's, that's ridiculous. You want to go probably slightly outside this, um, this confidence interval and see what happens. And you'll notice that very quickly going outside, uh, it very drops down to a very small percentage. It just shows how confident we are. Um, so again, my confidence interval is from about 118.5 to 119.5. Um, but really, it starts at 118.5859. So I'm actually just going to go with 118.5. I mean, that's technically outside the lower bound. It's a little less than the lower bound. Okay. And so what we want to do for that is we want to say, what's the probability that we'd get a sample like that? So we'd again be using the t distribution. And we need to get a um, sort of a z-score for this thing. and Remember, the idea of the z-score is that you would uh, take the number and then you would subtract the population mean. And we're working with the sampling distribution, right? Um, but the sample distribution population should match the population mean. Of course, we don't know the population mean, so we're going to use the sample mean in place of that. And then we divide by the square root of the sample size. Or sorry, we divide by the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Um, again, we have to take the sample standard deviation and then divide by the square root of the sample size. So this is dividing by the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Right? So that's a normal z-score formula, but we are using that special variation on the standard deviation that you've seen for sampling distributions. So. Uh, that gives you a z-score for this, and it's negative 2.35, which is, you know, outside of this. Now, to get the probability, we need to use the t-distribution. In this case, we're using the t-inverse. And if you, or sorry, we're not using the t-inverse, we're using the t-distribution. Uh, if you try to put this value in, you're going to get an error. Let me show you. So degrees of freedom is sample size minus 1. And then tails, it's just one. And it gives you that. Because the t distribution only takes positive values. Now, the t distribution, just like the normal, is symmetric. So, you know, the tail on the left that would be created by this is actually equivalent to the tail on the right. And so, you know, if you end up getting a negative value, you can just do the opposite of that and make the positive version. So, just a warning that this could come out positive or negative, and you really just want the absolute value of that. So if it comes out negative, just make it positive with a little negative sign there. And what you see is this is about 1%. In fact, it's a little less than 1%. Um, and you're thinking, wow, I mean, wouldn't you expect it to be more like 2.5%? Um, because if it's 95% confidence level, that's 5% in the tails, 2.5% in each tail. And we're right on that lower tail, aren't we? Well, not really. I mean, I'm at 1.5, and it's at 1.58. If you go to 1.58, right now you're getting a little closer to that tail. It still doesn't have the 6, so it is still outside. Right now you're getting close to that 2.5%. And, and you'll see that as you get closer and closer to that lower bound, you'll get closer to that 2.5%. Uh, so the next one would be 6. Right? And then, so slowly adding this and going to that lower bound, you'll find the lower bound is exactly that. But, but again, we didn't want to get right at the lower bound, um, though maybe that's a better activity. I, I wanted you to pick something right outside. So let's go back to our original value. Um, and we could even make that a percent just to show. All right, uh, so then as usual, just go ahead and uh, save your spreadsheet, because you will use this again. We have one last part of this project in Unit 5. Uh, and upload that uh, by clicking right on Project Unit 4. Um, save and upload that spreadsheet. Hopefully you found this video helpful, and I will see you in the next project tutorial video.